Welcome to the Chicago Bears Podcast. A presentation of ESPN Chicago, Chicago's home for sports. Here's your host, Pat, the designer. Bear on Bears fans, welcome into another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast. During OTAs, this is probably our most insightful episode because we do have Courtney Cronin in the building. Courtney, how are you today? I'm doing well. There seems to be no shortage of Bears news this morning, so that's always good for content. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, you, we had an entirely different show planned, and then you dropped an amazing article on us about uh, Jalen Johnson's situation. So we do have to lead off with that, uh, kind of what he's been going through and and uh, uh, wh- where he's been, basically. Uh, also, got to talk about uh, Nate Davis still being a no-show. We haven't really delved deep into Nate Davis. I feel like me and McKee have kind of talked about it a little bit, but uh, that's a weird one. Like, it doesn't even make sense at this point that he's not hit. Like, he's literally just taking the it's voluntary approach. Um, and then Cody White here spoke as well. Khalil Herbert, all that and more on today's episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Make sure that you guys are tuned in with us. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the page, man, because we will be doing this five days a week throughout the entire offseason and NFL season. Let's get into the first quarter. Courtney. Jalen Johnson has been a no-show. This has been a topic for basically two weeks now, but he did speak on KJM on ESPN Radio this morning, Keyshawn, J. Will, and Max on uh, ESPN Radio this morning and talked about where he's been. You wrote a good article on it. What has been the feeling about where Jalen Johnson's been, how, how this whole process is going? Has he been in meetings, all of that? I think the vibe I got yesterday at OTAs is that coaches and players expected Jalen Johnson and expect Jalen Johnson to be there sooner rather than later. But this is before we had heard from him on KJM. And I I thought the most telling comment came from John Hoke, cornerbacks coach, who this is his first year getting to work with Jalen Johnson. And he hasn't physically gotten to work with Jalen Johnson, but the amount of props he was giving him for staying engaged and he was involved in Zoom meetings or he's Zooming into like team and position meetings. He's watching practice uh, film and, and asking questions about what's going on. Hoke yeah. said that they text about every other day. So he's clearly staying engaged. It's not like he's been away from the facility and doesn't have his mind on anything that's going on during the offseason program. He's just not there for voluntary workouts. But what he did say he will quote for sure be there next week for the final week of these OTA workouts because then mandatory mini camp is June 15th, 13 through the 15th. And there are fines that teams can levy against players if they opt to miss mandatory mini camp and don't have an excused absence. Nobody wants to be fined upwards of $30,000 a day. Yeah. So especially someone going into a contract year. So it makes sense if there is no deal done uh, up until that point that he would show up next week. I, I'm not surprised by it. The timing of this interview coming after uh, two weeks of OTAs now and his absence is a little curious just because I, I know he's probably trying to like course correct the, maybe like the narrative that's out there about him right now and why he's skipping. But he did, he did say that his, the reason for his absence for what he is doing right now Sounds like he's back home in Fresno, California. He's he's a young daughter. Um, He's a young dad. So, like, he's been with her. Uh, I know that she stays back there during the season. So, it's not like they have a whole ton of time together throughout the year. So, this is his chance to be an active parent. And also, um, he has a non-for-profit foundation for a friend of his that was killed in 2021 by gun violence. And he said that he had a lot of, like, off-the-field you know, business ventures he's working on as it relates to this foundation, like fundraisers, uh, being able to raise funds for this foundation, other, you know, business entities that he's working on in regards to that. So it sounds like he's at least stayed busy. It might not be Bears football 24-7 right now, but he is doing other things that, you know, would, would lead you to believe like, oh, okay, that's why he's missing OTAs. Because remember, they are voluntary, even though sometimes that feels like voluntary in name only. And, and here's what I'll say, right? Like, listen, I, I know, right? I went hard on him. I, McKee went hard on him talking about how if you're a leader, uh, you have to be here. 
that still stands. I, I, and I think that the coaches believe that. I think that what we heard from the coaches yesterday, they believe that. And like you said, the vibe around there is that Jalen Johnson was wanted to be there and he has missed now two weeks. Now, him coming back next week, love it. Get in here. But I, I think that what pointed it out yesterday to me that they wanted him here, and I think this applies to Nate Davis when we talk about him later on in the show as well. Flu said this is invaluable information. I don't know, right? I've, I've never been through an OTA practice. But if your head coach believes that this information that he's giving you at this point in the season is setting you up for the season is invaluable, it probably is important for you to move things around, for you to be there and schedule things differently for you to be there. And it seems like the coaches might feel the same way on that. I definitely got that vibe from Alan Williams when he talked yesterday where he was asked, this was a head of practice, like, hey, are we going to see Jalen Johnson out there? And it was very tongue in cheek. He's like, can I say no comment? And he was like laughing. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to say no comment. And they all take the same mindset of we're going to coach the guys that are here. We want guys who want to be here, but it is voluntary. They will keep deferring to that because – you know, you can't crucify a guy for not being there when technically they have the opportunity to either show up or not show up. Yeah. But what William said, like we have the best, you know, the best of the best, the best coaches, the best train, uh, training staff, the best strength and conditioning, the best dietitians, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's how he, ve it's very much like him showing how he feels about OTAs and that like they are voluntary in nature, but you should be here. And yeah. I just, I know this that the CBA, the way that it was, uh, the way it's structured, and I, you know, the NFLPA is never going to push for a hundred percent attendance at at workouts during the off season. They want to give guys the flexibility of if you want to be there, great. It's obviously very important for certain players, you know, younger players, players who are like starting out with a new team, but they're never going to say. Like, this is a priority for us to make sure that everybody's there. That would be what the NFL would want for sure. Yeah. But the NFLPA is not going to do that because it doesn't benefit their players to have any sort of hard line in the sand about you either have to be here or you're going to get fined. That does the players no service. So the wiggle room that they have is to the benefit of the players. And it may, it might hurt, you know, use air quotes on that, hurt the team. But someone like Jalen Johnson, that – the only person he'd be doing a disservice to would be himself. That's that's the only thing because he's entering a contract year. We know that he has not inked an extension yet. Back in the off season, he said he thought things would be heating up pretty soon, and they haven't because there's yeah. no deal struck right now. So it's it's on him at this point, and he's clearly prioritizing other things. Like people have lives outside of football, which sometimes we forget, but he's prioritizing other things that mean you know a great deal to him over being here for voluntary workouts. He gets a little bit more of a pass for that because he's been in this defense. He's been with the team since 2020. He's yeah. been in this defense now for a year, and he's a veteran player. He's, you know, the best cornerback that they have in the secondary. And I just – I think that it's a lot different. It's a lot different look for someone like him versus anybody else that's not showing up for OTAs that doesn't have, a, uh, you know, a, an injury excuse at this moment because – the general consensus you get in talking to people is Jalen's a leader. He'll be fine when he gets back in this program. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things where the only thing that I've questioned with Jalen Johnson not being there, I know he knows the system. I know that he knows, the for the most part, the coaches that are there. The, the biggest part that I've questioned is if you're a leader, all the other leaders were there. Tremaine Edmonds showed up. Justin Fields, of course, is there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Guys who were in contract years are there. Chase Claypool's out there to prove something in his contract year. Cole Komet had a heck of a season last year, still out there to prove something in his contract year. So I think that that's kind of where, where, for me, from outside looking at, even for McKee, right? McKee talked about this uh, yesterday as well. He said, you can't be a leader and not be in the building. You can't be that guy that's the leader of this young DB room, which we'll talk about them as well, where they're making some plays. They're coming up. They're showing strides. So, I, I listen, I'm glad that he's doing things for, for um, his, his friend who, who was, um, you know, who was fallen. Uh, I'm glad that he's with his daughter. But at the end of the day, you know what time of the year OTAs is. This was not a surprise to you that OTA, yeah. it didn't just pop up on you. No, that last it, week OTA showed up. And his, and like, you know, what he said on his radio interview this morning, none of that 
excuse none of it like takes away like oh you're in a contract year like your absence could still very well be triggered not just by the things that you're doing at home but like what's going on contractually guys use that as it's a strategy it's not players having like malicious intent of oh like screw the team anything like that it's literally how deals get struck you have to put pressure you have to use your leverage that you have and you know some people say well he doesn't have much leverage he has one career interception in three seat in 39 games played and you know that the bears are going to want to see him prove it before they pay him like all of that could be true but like he has the right to not show up and to utilize his stance and his leverage and his you know position in that defense to try to help himself get a contract it might not yeah. work but he has yeah. every right to do that and sometimes that gets lost in like the mix because you're right like you do like if you're a fan of the team, you want to see everything starting to gel now. You want it to look perfect or at least show signs that when they get back for training camp, it's going to look really good. And you just it, it's always putting cart before the horse because it never yeah. looks like a finished product at this time <laughs> of year. But Did you see Kyle Trask and Baker Mayfield out there? Good Lord. Yeah, we better I mean, win that game. <laughs> it. I think this is all going to have a resolution because coaches don't talk about this in the way that – these two, John Hoke and and Matt Eberflutes talked about. Um, they don't. They usually will be like no comment or be like, "Look, you got to ask Jalen when he gets here." Like putting the onus on the player. Yeah. They both made it sound like they expected him back, and this was Wednesday. And then of course he comes on uh, radio this morning and says, "Yeah, I'm for sure going to be there next week." So who knows when the, when the deal will get struck if it does at all. But you know, I think it is important for him. He realized, he said at the end of that interview that he hasn't been part of a winning team, which is factually accurate. Like he knows that winning with winning comes paychecks. So he said his focus now much different than year three. He was probably feeling a lot of, he was definitely feeling a lot of pressure. I don't know if that was leading him to play tight or anything like that, but he said, he was so focused on it last year. Like now the focus is just winning games because when you win games, you typically are part of teams that get a lot of attention. And, and certainly if you're doing your job as a lockdown corner and the number one corner in this defense, you're going to, you know, you're going to draw a lot of notoriety to yourself, which most times in the NFL will come with dollar signs. The one thing I'll give him is I don't think there's another time where he does have leverage like he has now just because of the thinness of the DB room, right? Like when we look at the DB room, we're coming out of here talking about two guys every day, Kyler Gordon and Tyreek Stevens. Like (laughs) that tells you how thin your DB room realistically is. And so it does. I think that from a from a. If you're going to, you know, voice your opinion, voice where you stand on your contract right now, and he is coming back for the third week of OTA, he's going to love to have him back out there again. Like you said, he's the best DB we have out there. It's just that that's kind of the issue when you look at it, that how thin this room is, he stands out as our best DB, even though you haven't seen what you hoped to see from him at this point in his career. Yeah, and when you have a player like that and they're not there, it's always going to be noticeable. Again, the idea that these things are voluntary is just, it's just a word that they use. They're really not because we don't, we don't talk, we don't like look past it. When somebody's not there, it's noticeable and it draws questions as to why are they not there? And you're never going to get coaches typically talking or like anybody really speaking out about somebody's absence at this time of year and saying much about it because they don't have to. So they're going to try to tell you as little as possible. To me, Jalen Johnson taking this radio interview and and going to tell his side of things as to look like I'm not like a bad teammate. I'm not this. I'm not that. Like I had reasons. Here are my reasons as to why I'm not there right now, but I'll be there next week. And I'm sure he'll speak with the media. I'm sure he'll have a chance to kind of clear the air even further. But this was a good first step, at least for him, in trying to control the uh, the conversation around his absence and what's next. Yeah, hey, let's hope. Let's hope uh, what's next is a lot of interceptions uh, and, and a great it, day it of training. It would help his case. It would help his case <laughs> to try and get a contract. That's the, that's the that's the one thing. Like I I do. Here's the tough part, Riley. When you look at the advanced analytics and all that on Jalen Johnson, it's like, yeah, he's a good DB. He's still not a great BB. And I think that's the question mark to me when when I look at, right, like his contract situation is, okay, are we just going to pay a guy so that we have DBs in the room? Or is Tyreek Stevenson eventually going to be this guy's replacement? And maybe Jalen Johnson is feeling that pressure a little bit now. 
or right. Like I, I just, I don't look at, I look at Jalen Johnson as a very above average DB. Mm-hmm. How much are you willing Fair. to pay above average? Yeah. <laughs> and, and they have four guys right now that are in line. I mean, you guess you could throw Travis Gibson in there too, because Gibson he was part too, of yeah. that 2020 class, but who signed with clutch. So we know what he's about to do. <laughs> going to try and i mean <laughs> i i just think that they are really going to show us what their strategy and prioritization of these contract extensions are because we haven't seen we don't have a blueprint yet so them yeah. slow playing it is not oh we don't like these players we don't want to pay them necessarily but maybe there is a time and a place that they want to get these things done in terms of their front office priorities and maybe it's not right now maybe they aren't going to be a team that gives out big contract extensions april may june maybe they wait till the eve of training camp or even the eve of the season we've seen stuff like that happen before and we just don't know what ryan Poles' strategy for doing that sort of business is yeah. just yet yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I, again, like you said, would this be Jalen would probably be the first player he's extended, right? Yeah, he would be the first. He yep. would be the first player to Ryan Poe's extended. Ryan be getting him out of there, boy. He ain't playing. He's like, y'all not, y'all not messing up my salary cap. Hey, I got a spot in San Diego for you. Let's keep it moving along because we do have a couple of really good DBs to talk about that have been at OTAs and that have been actually making plays. Uh, let's get to the second quarter because... Second quarter. Kyler Gordon has uh, really settled in here in year two. He looked he looked pretty good second half of year one. Looked like he finally started to uh, settle in. Ended up with the three interceptions last season. Uh, I, I felt like he he felt a little bit more comfortable. But now, even being able to just focus on the position, what are you seeing from Kyler Gordon? What are the coaches seeing from Kyler Gordon that is standing out in his second year in this OTA? I think the biggest thing for Kyler is the ability to focus really in on one thing. And that's not to say he's never going to play outside corner again, but even he admitted yesterday that, you know, he kind of misses doing that, but it is better for him to just have like the, the nickel corner spot to focus on and how often teams, especially the bears are in their, you know, they're in sub packages. They are going to use him. They use him as a starter. Most teams, I mean, I hate when people are like, oh, the fifth corner, like whatever, or the fifth DB. No, the the nickel is a starting position. When you're playing in the slot like that, you are a starter. And so for him to focus on that position and not have to like take this plethora of information in the way that he did as a rookie where it's like, okay, I'm starting on the outside. Like go look at his PFF stats. I have them at the snap counts right here. Like starting like week one, he was in the slot, like 46 snaps. He was up in the box seven snaps. He played outside corner 13 snaps. Like, he's all over the place. And I just think that that's a lot of information because the slot is, like, one of the hardest positions to play in any given defense. Like, you're a traffic cop weaving in and out of traffic yourself. And so you don't have the boundary to work with. You don't have, you know, some of the things that make playing outside corner, you know, matching up against number one. You're, like – There's just a lot that goes into it. So I think for Kyler Gordon and what we've heard from Alan Williams, he was talking about his RPM. So rotation, I believe that's rotations per minute. Like that's, it's when I think of RPMs, I think of the car, you know, the little circle in your car and you like rev the engine and it goes into the red. (laughs) He said that he's not in the red as much this year. And I guess that's a term that they use in the building. So it's not just always just using this car analogy to like explain where Kyler Gordon is because Kyler's like, oh yeah, like my RPMs, you know, I want to conserve my energy so I'm not going 100 miles an hour all the time because eventually, like, you just can't sustain that pace. And I think it's working smarter, not harder for yeah. Kyler Gordon when his workload hasn't necessarily been truncated, but it's been more streamlined where, hey, we want you to be the best. We dra- they drafted him to be a nickel. I mean, he, he yeah. grabbed hold of that job pretty early on in his rookie season and he went through the roller coaster of having to play multiple positions in a defense and finally settling in last year. And, and the consistency elements, what you want to see more of from him and getting there in year two. A lot of players make that jump year one to year two. That's got to be the main focus for him where 
you can have a series of good plays, but if there's a bad play, if there's, you know, if you miss your key on something, if you don't read something correctly, don't let that set you back for the next 10 plays. And I think that comes with everybody. I mean, he was their highest draft pick last year, so there's definitely a little bit more of a spotlight on him for that. But he's a very critical piece to this defense. And to be able to utilize the things that he did wrong last year and things that he did right and use that database, so to speak, to, to build on, hey, I know how to play this position and I can do it really successfully – that's where he's got a that's where that's really where like it starts for him in the offseason program. This is another reason what gets me excited about this team, right? It, it, and I told McKee yesterday, I said, I, I hate this, but as the season's getting closer, I swear I'm drinking a Bears Kool Aid. Like, it's not, it's not like the, you know, like, like it's not red. It's not 13 win Kool Aid out here. It's not the brown, you know, it's, it's, it's a mixture, you know, nine, nine wins, you know, I, I, but I, I think that. The reason that I'm getting excited about this season is I'm not hearing we've got this guy here, but we're trying him there. We've got this guy here, but we're trying him there. We've got like these guys are getting an opportunity to learn the position that they were brought here to play. And my God, that was my pet peeve with the Matt Nagy era. Why in God's good green earth would we draft a right tackle and say, yeah, let's try him at center. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Draft the left tackle and say, yeah, let's try him at guard. Like that, the, I, I feel like, like with everybody, if I can focus on this thing and become really, really good at this, I can dominate you with this. I can still be good at that. I think that, and I think, right, was it, um, Alan, was it Alan Williams, I think, was talking yesterday, and, and he said he's going to probably have to play some outside, listen to football. People get That's hurt. That's why they so. cross train. Like, I mean, yeah. the offensive line does it where you're going to see, like, you know, the combination is pretty much set as of right now, but you're still going to see guys with different units, whether it's first team, second team, third team, moving in and out, trying different positions, because chances are it's a violent sport. People are going to get hurt. So you need to have a backup option and not, you know, I think for what, what Alan Williams said was that he doesn't want Kyler Gordon to ever be in a position like, man, I haven't played any outside corner in a while. Like what's my leverage on this? Yeah, what do I have to yeah. do on this certain play? Like you have to keep guys fresh and keep, you know, you know, really keep guys up to up to task on that stuff. And so it's it's always going to happen. But primary predominantly his role is going to be playing in the slot where he excelled at Washington. And that's what the Bears envisioned for him from the day they drafted him. Yeah, it, it's it's just good to see that guys are getting the opportunity to do what they do best. But I because I feel like right again, when contract times come up, We sit there and we look at the player and we say, okay, but you weren't good at this. Yeah, well, I wasn't supposed to be doing that. I look I look at it like, right, how the Bulls were this season. Everybody, right, like, listen, the Bulls weren't a great team at all. But what I said all season was, well, yeah, Zach Levine's playing point guard. You didn't pay Zach Levine $215 million to be a point guard. That's a problem. All of a sudden, he gets to play shooting guard, and he's one of the best shooting guards in the NBA again. So I think that... Right, we we overlook that sometimes, and these are the things that GMs and different people will look at and say, "Well, yeah, well, you weren't doing this, you weren't making these plays." It's like, yeah, well, it's because of this reason you didn't bring me here to do this. The fact that we're putting guys in position where they're actually going to be able to go out there and do what they do best uh, that does get me excited for this season. I think it gives the Bears a little bit of a step ahead of a lot of teams who are, were where we were last season that are in flux and trying to figure out where they are taking this next step. Yeah, there's definitely a difference between this guy projects better playing this position in the NFL, like, you know, in terms of like the the measurables of a player, yeah. we hear, you know, we heard it a lot with the offensive line and, you know, going to Peter Skaronsky, oh, he's probably a guard yeah. in the NFL. You hear that a lot, like, especially in the offensive line. It's one thing if guys are, are told they're going to transition into a different spot because it's a better fit. It's a different thing. Like I'm playing out of position because there's mitigating circumstances yeah. that are beyond a player's control that put them in a spot where they have to play something that they're not necessarily comfortable with. And, that, and that's not, not just the cornerback room. That has been a lot of different places. I mean, look at Eddie Jackson. Like sometimes when you bring somebody else in and it gives you the opportunity to play a position or go back to playing a position like for him playing free yeah. safety, that's, you 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 see players really thrive in that because yeah. you know I, I know we go through oh they get paid a lot of money they should be able to adjust and adapt it gets really freaking hard these are like the one percenters of all athletic people period yeah. and to ask players 
especially like a young rookie, like when Kyler Gordon got in here and having to play arguably the most difficult position in the secondary and then also having to like take in all this information and everything else and knowing that the secondary was going to be like was one of the worst in 2021 and they did make they did make improvements last year in terms of the personnel but that it was going to be a long work in progress you can't really fault him for how up and down his rookie season was and I just I just felt like with the mindset we, like he expressed yesterday like the confidence and overall demeanor that like it's going to be okay like I, no. I've gotten the hardest part I mean there will definitely be hard parts again but he's got the hardest part out of the way so giving himself some grace which I think everybody can you know afford to express towards players who go through those transitional periods like that's that's all he's got to do at least at this part of OTAs and then going into like training camp it's going to be a different element of like okay what does he need to do now and then what's the next thing so I I think he's honestly like right on track of where he needs to be yeah, no, it, it it gets me excited to see, you know, the, these guys, how they're talking early on, how they how how comfortable they feel and even how the coaches are talking. The one thing that stood out to me yesterday with the coaching staff as well, um, Tyreek Stevenson made a made a good play on Justin C, uh, Justin, Justin Stevenson, Justin Fields mm -hmm. um, ends up getting the pick, jump the route. Beautiful play going the other way. Defense is hype. When they, when, uh, um, you know, we heard from uh, DB's coach, um, John Hoke, John Hoke uh, after, afterwards, he was like, yeah, I love it. It's a good play. But also, you know, he's got to catch the ball the right way. He had that mm -hmm. same play last week and he dropped it because he wasn't catching the ball the right way. Like these guys, there's a standard that we're seeing this coaching staff hold these players to even in their successes, and they're not wavering off of that. I love to see that, and I think that that's going to be helpful for this room in the long run, especially a young guy like Tyreek Stevenson, who I think the Bears have really high hopes on. Yeah, and him being here is overall going to help Kyler Gordon. and. Yeah you know, help the rest of the secondary, it's twofold because you get somebody in who's a third round pick. He's projected to start outside. Um, they're not going to be working him into the slot because that's Kyler Gordon's role. Now, does he have slot flexibility? Yeah. He played it at Georgia. It was half the reason that he left to go to Miami because he wasn't happy with that position, but in a pinch, if you need him, he can play it. Like that's right. Like they've got clear defined priorities for these guys from the wide receiver room down to the cornerbacks and everybody else in the secondary. And so I look at that and I think that the developments you're seeing at a very early stage of OTAs, but he was playing with the twos last week, Tyreek Stevenson and yeah. Alan Williams. Like we asked him like, what, what does he need to do to maybe get some reps with the ones? His idea was, you know, make plays. It's pretty, you know, bare bones, obvious, but like do the do things consistently. I mean, they throw a lot at these guys. And so for him to then go out and make a play, like that's showing you that the coaching, the like the ability to like grasp concepts and, and understand football, they've really praised his football IQ a lot, which typically for a rookie, it's so overwhelming because it's just yeah. so different than what you did in college. The rules for cornerbacks are different. You can't get away with grabbing as much as you did in college. So at all that learning curve, it's going to be steep and that's fine. Um, that's what you expect, but it really sounds like not just the on the field stuff, but he's really impressed them in the meeting room with his ability to read and understand concepts that probably are pretty advanced for someone who has not played in the NFL yet. And you're learning all of the, different fits in this defense and, and all the things he's going to be responsible for. And he's going to have, to, it's a position of need because of yeah. course you think Jalen Johnson on the other side and then Tyreek Stevenson more than likely at the other outside corner spot, the communication back there. It's one thing Kyler Gordon talked about when he went back and watched the film of his 2022 season Miscommunication. I mean, God, how many times have we heard that <laughs> last year? And, and so much of that is what position do I need to be in? Where do yeah. you need to be? And I need to know where you need to be. So like, that's, that's how I look at it, that it's, it's a lot of moving parts. And for a young cornerback to at least show the signs that he's getting it this early on, the coaching staff can't be anything but pleased about that. Is uh, Tyreek Stevenson the guy who kind of ends up being Jaquan Brisker for Eddie Jackson, right? Like, is Tyree Stevenson that for, for Jalen Johnson and Kyler Gordon? 
I mean, he's going to man the out, an outside spot. So I just think that that frees up. I think the, I think the, just the, the, I understand the analogy. And I think that for, you know, for Eddie last year, not having to play up in the box and not having to, you know, make those All of a sudden he was physical back. plays. Yeah. Like <laughs> he wants to be roaming in the back yeah. end of the defense where, Jaquan Brisker will, you know, do sacrifice his body, do whatever he needs to do to make a play. He likes playing up near line of scrimmage. He likes sacking the quarterback, um, yeah. as evidenced by like leading the team in sacks last year. But it's it's a situation that I think has parallels to that. And I I say that because like Eddie had like I know that he people criticize him for like oh you didn't have two interceptions you you didn't have an interception for two years after signing yeah. a contract of course there were plenty of plays that got called back all sorts of things like that you know for Kyler Gordon we don't know it's not that like oh he has to get back to this version of himself and Tyreek Stevenson coming in here is going to help him do that we don't know what the version looks like because he went right. through a very steep learning curve as a rookie so. In, in theory, yeah, that makes sense that he should be able to, like Tyreek Stevenson coming in, should be able to elevate everybody at the cornerback spot and everybody in the secondary. But I, I think it really boils down to Kyler Gordon can then play one spot and play it really, really well and focus in on what he needs to do because he's going to be dictating a lot of what the outside corner's responsibilities are because as, as a nickel, like you are res- you're responsible for so much more than – than what those guys are because you're playing much you're playing at different levels of the defense. So it's it's yeah. important. No, oh, I just I, I feel like that he could be that piece that just allows them to play more free. Right. Like I, I, that's that's what I saw from Eddie Jackson last year. It just looked like he was playing free again. All right. The the two interceptions uh or the two years with no interceptions, I do agree with you on uh, the part where like there's some that were called back. I remember just looking and being like, there's no way you're calling that a block in the back or there's no <laughs> way that you're like he had the worst luck fall for him for two years straight. But I also think that, right, like Eddie Jackson to me is a guy that wants to drop the shoulder and lay the boom on people not so much do the wrap up tackle. I think that Jaquan Brisker allows him to be more free with that because I know somebody's going to protect me on the backside a little bit more. Um, I think that that's kind of what, you know, Kyler Gordon can do. Jalen Johnson can do uh, with Tyreek Stevens now, Stevenson now uh, on the other side. I think it just allows them to everybody to kind of relax and play a little bit more free and just go out there and play ball, play the game that they love. man. so uh, let's keep this thing moving along because it is halftime. And I bring to you a nugget today, Courtney, because you brought an etiquette topic to the uh, podcast last time. And so today I have to ask you, what is proper etiquette for bachelor or bachelorette party? Reason being, going to Vegas this weekend for my guy's party. We're going to be out there four days, great time, drinks, all of that. Best man sends a text message. He shouldn't have to pay for anything. The bachelor. The the bachelor. Mm-hmm. Huh? Huh? That's that's a that's a lot of money. We going to Vegas, my guy. Like I, I wasn't. I, I was trying to just get myself out there. We paying for him for everything. So everybody kind of had the back and forth with it. it who's doing what? What's going to happen here? Should the bachelor and or bachelorette live scotch free? or at the bachelor party vacation trip? It depends how many people are going in the group. So I've been to a number of bachelorette parties where we pick up the majority of the tab for the bachelorette. Like that's just kind of always how it's been, but it's, it can get really pricey. Like you have to think, all right, how many people are coming to this thing? Who's putting the majority of the stuff, the lodging, the food on their credit card, because you're Venmoing like, First off, have, have designate that person first. That's like yeah. you've got to be a number one rule. Whoever has like a, a high enough limit on their credit card that they can pay for it. It's like, you know, if the hotel hasn't been paid for, if the food hasn't been paid for, it's so like one credit card when you go out to the bar, one credit card when you go to dinner, then that person keep all of the notes, receipts, and then ask, you know, everybody, hey, here's my Venmo, here's my quick pay, yeah, Venmo yeah. me for that. And I think you can determine at that point, like, I mean, I would assume, it, did this bachelor, is he paying to get himself out there? He's paying to get himself out there. He paid okay. for his trip. All right. Where are you guys, like, I'm not going to say, like, are you staying at a very expensive hotel on the Strip? Uh, we're, we will be on the Strip. It's not very expensive, but expensive enough. Okay. How many guys are going? 
Uh, we have uh, six guys in total. Six okay. guys in total. Including The Bachelor? or Including The Bachelor. Okay. So divided by five, it's definitely going to be more expensive than if you were to have like 10 or 12 people yeah. in a party. But I think because Vegas can be so over the top and bottle service and shows and gambling... It gets, you have to like allocate, okay, I'm going to pay, I think you should have like a a family meeting before you guys get there. Like we are paying for the bachelor for this, that, and the other thing, but everybody's on their own for gambling. Everybody's on their own for, um, you know, anything else that would not be like a group activity. That's how I would approach it. And see, here's the thing. The Bachelor's, uh, right, one of my best friends. I'm in the wedding, blah, blah, blah. So I, I literally, I was kicking it with him last weekend in Milwaukee, and I looked him in the face, and I said, I'm not paying for everything for you because you have expensive taste. And he just started tough, laughing. Man. He like, was like, he was like, listen, gonna I'm going to want the bottle of Henny. He was like, I'm going to want the full bottle of Henny. It's like, I'm not getting you the full bottle of Henny at the club that's upcharging on the Henny oh, by $300. I think one night of bottle service, like, I think you guys got to split it up. Like, how many yeah, going yeah, for yeah. three days? Uh, we'll be there three days. So we'll be there. We're leaving today. We're, we're drinking all night today. Uh, we'll be there tomorrow and then Saturday and we fly back Sunday. All right. I, if you want to keep co- costs like relative to, you know, having five people there, do one night of bottle service. You don't need to do it every single night. I think it's overrated. I think it's overpriced. Yeah. Like, cool. People, they bring girls out with sparklers. Like, <laughs> you've seen it enough. Like, you've seen it. You're an adult, Pat. You've seen this before. Yeah. It's not that cool anymore. It's After not. You, you've seen it once. You've seen it enough. And I just think that if you're going to do one night of it, super cool. Like, five yeah. guys splitting is not buying one bottle of Hennessy too. Like, let's be real. You probably have like, you know, I mean, multiple things as part of your yeah. VIP section. Yes. Just even getting in the VIP can be like two grand. So like, yeah. you have like a minimum to spend. So I think one night of that, making sure like everybody looks each other in the eye, we're doing one night of this. And then making sure that if you go out like another time, it might be like for drinks, it could be for a show, it could be for gambling, that it's not as, okay, we got to do this three nights in a row. Because that's when... That's when credit card debt can come into play. For Absolutely. For <laughs> hey, listen, and they, and they look at me and they're like, well, you got that ESPN money. Hold on, dog. Like, this ain't the same level of money. Which I think, I'm not Stephen A. I'm, I'm Pat. I'm still Pat. Don't worry about it. Hey, let us know in the comments below, man. Are we, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's, uh, is that Carmen and Yurko's segment? No, that's, uh, yeah, it's Carmen and Yurko's. Who's the douche? Are we the yeah. douche for, for looking at our boy and being like, hey, man, you get one night. That's all you get. <laughs> Appreciate y'all for tuning in. Let's keep this thing moving along. Hit that like button if you guys haven't done so. Make sure to comment on anything we've talked about. Jalen Johnson being at OTAs next week. We also talked about kind of what those other DBs in the room are looking like. What that's going to be. Let us know in the comments below. Now it's time to ask the hard-hitting questions. Courtney, the question that everybody wants to know. Where on God's green earth is Nate Davis and why is he not here when we've talked about the coaches saying this information is invaluable, at least with Jalen Johnson, he's played for the Bears before. I know that the question was asked on how, right, like he was in a similar scheme. Is that going to transfer over here? Where is Nate Davis? (laughs) It's tough. You're not going to get any answers on it. And I know Fluce was asked yesterday all right, like he's not here for a second straight week of OTAs. Can you say, is it injury related? I mean, he wouldn't get into any of that. I think if there was an injury, first off, I'd be like, why did you sign this guy? Because they just got him. So you don't want to look, if you're the team, you don't want to reveal any sort of information about that. But it's, it's certainly kind of like it raises an eyebrow because what Field said last week was that he wants the players who are the young players and the new players who are learning this offense to be here for OTAs. Cause, cause Justin Fields was very like complimentary of Jalen Johnson said, no, like we know, we know he's going to be fine when he gets here. He's coming at some point. Sometimes players say those things and like, it's just wishful thinking. They want to put it into the ether and hope it'll happen. Maybe that's the case here, but you know, Nate Davis, I don't, I don't know if he gets a pass for that. So like, I will be very curious when he does, indeed show up for minicamp because you just signed a three year $30 million contract. Do you really want to start paying that? Like, what is the issue? Um, and, and here's the thing where you never want to go all in and say, well, he's, you know, the, 
you criticizing a guy for not being there. Maybe there is something in his life that's going on that requires him to be away from the team. It would be so much easier for the sake of not speculating if, if there were, if there was some sort of forthcoming um, about why guys are not there. But again, it's their own personal lives. It's their business, even though this is our business to ask about these things. And yeah. I, I think the biggest thing I got from Cody Whitehair yesterday, like he brought up Nate Davis, like he's played in a zone scheme, zone blocking scheme before. We talked to him in uh, March after the free agents were signed, and he mentioned, you know, I remember asking about like, hey, like you know, you blocked for the two thousand yard season for for Derrick Henry, like how cool is that? And he really takes a lot of pride in that. So there's a lot of similarities for you know, best rushing team in the NFL. Last year, Chicago Bears, of course, some of that was because of the quarterback and how much he ran. But, you know, I think scheme wise, you know, it's not to say like, oh, we just need to learn anything. You need to like, it's pretty important to gel with the guys that are, you know, on the offensive line with you. And and he's going to start at right guard. But I, I just, at this point of the off season, voluntary workouts are one thing, but when you haven't been with the team, it's about the culture and the team building and, you know, you're the new guy, new yeah. guy in an offensive line room. It's a position that needs to appear like an orchestra. Everybody hitting the same note at the same time. And if you're not there, even no matter how good you are, it's still difficult to get that down. It doesn't happen in, you know, the blink of an eye. Even Cody Whitehair yesterday was talking about himself. And, you know, he's very appreciative to the Bears that they let him know very early in the offseason, hey, we're going to move you to center. Because that gives him the time to mentally prepare for the move and getting the timing down in a snap and the cadence yeah. with Justin Fields. That stuff takes time. Yeah. He may not be – Nate Davis isn't snapping Justin Fields the ball, but being a part of this scheme, being a part of an offensive line and knowing what the guy to the left and right of you is doing, that's really important. So you'd hope for his sake that he's there – by mini camp, um, that would certainly bring up like some really big questions if he wasn't yeah. there for that. But again, I I think a lot of times guys are just looking at this saying, all right, like if I if there is something more pressing in my personal life that requires me to be away, if it's not injury related, they're gonna do that, which is you know their choice. Is there a concern that it could be injury related, kind of around rumblings? Is there no, a concern that he might not be there anything. for that? I haven't okay. heard anything yet. And if that does come out, then you're going to look at the signing and say, okay, well, when did you know this? Did this come yeah. up in a physical, like the pre-signing physical? I mean, stuff we're hearing about Jimmy Garoppolo right now is kind of like, well, why the hell did you guys do this? Knowing that you just yes. did a you, you just did a scan on his foot and you're like, oh, wait, you're going to need surgery on this, but we're still going to sign you to this big contract. Anyways, it's just like the process in which things happen, chicken and the egg. Like if that comes after that, like you're going to be like, this is a horrible signing. So yeah. hopefully – Nothing comes out about that, like for Nate Davis, but it is, um, it would be very jarring, I think, to find out that he did have an injury or there was something else. And, and sometimes guys, when they train, can get injured. That yeah, happens. it takes something. So maybe it's something like that. That's, but it, as long as it's not, hey, he was dealing with this last year. Oh, they knew about it at the time that he, you know, signed his contract. Then, then that's like what you really don't want to have to deal with. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, listen, we saw a couple of guys yesterday, right? Cl- Claypool was on the sideline. Mm-hmm. Um, and and Flu just Lucas, said, you Lucas know, Patrick. Soft, Lucas Patrick, you know, Flu said soft tissue stuff, you know. Yeah. And that <laughs> which, happens. Which I think is also his blanket. Like anybody who's injured at this time, it's soft tissue stuff. Oh, like, my I- goodness. That's the <laughs> Unless there's like a bone break um, yeah. or something, you know, like Lucas Patrick, we find out about the hand injury two days into training camp. Yeah. Um, last year. And then it's like, okay, well, because that one's going to put him out for a while, like that one came out more, you know, that one came out sooner rather than yeah. some of the other ones where he's day to day, he's day to day, he's day to day. How many times do we hear that? And it's like, okay, well, when does day to day become week to week? That's what you have to be worried about during training camp because this coaching staff and, and, and Matt Eberflus has been very hands off about not, it's not mean about it. Like other yeah. coaches I've covered who like will rip your head off if you ask an injury question. He just, isn't going to get into the details about it because he doesn't have to not yeah. at this time of the off season. I mean, even during like the season, he won't say much, but this is uh, like, unless a guy's going to IR, he's not going to say diddly about it. He cracks me up too, because it's like, it is like, I remember last season, I, I think he was talking about, I think it was Lucas. 
and it was just like it's, it's day to day. And it was like, ah, you know, we're, we're monitoring the situation. It's still, it's still, you know, it, it's still murky right now. We don't know what the doctors are telling us yet. And finally just shows up. He's like, yeah, so you, uh, we're putting them on IR. We're going to get them out of here. And uh, it was like, wait a minute. Hold on. Like, it was day to day. Like, that, know, that jump go, was huge. How do you go from day to day to IR? Well, I guess things happen. <laughs> um, that's always going to be the excuse. Like, yeah, something unforeseen circumstances, right? Like, that's the, that's the tough one. It, it, it is. It, it's one of those things where, like, and I, I look at the situation kind of now with Nate Davis, and the only reason I am worried, because mm-hmm. I don't view him as the leader. Like, for me, with Jalen Johnson, it's the leadership thing. It's, it's always going to be, right, if you're a leader, you should be there. I don't view Nate Davis as the leader of this offensive line. To me, that's probably Cody White here. Um, he's the veteran in the room. Yeah. He's, he's, he's the most tenured bear. Is he the most tenured bear on the team? Yeah, he is fun. Yeah. It would be Eddie Jackson after him. That's crazy. Uh yeah, so he's the most tenured bear on the team. Uh so you know that he's going to be a leader uh vocally, but the problem that I have is Nate Davis, you got a rookie standing next to you. A rookie that probably would benefit from you. For sure being there so that he understands how you play, where you're going to be, so that you understand what he needs to improve upon and be able to relay that message to him. The, I I think that I'm probably more worried about Nate Davis's situation not being here because of Justin's comments where he did say, listen, we want all the new guys to be here. Uh, and because like going into training camp, going into this season, that's a position where you kind of need to know who the guys around you are Mm -hmm. because if they move in a way that you weren't expecting one that can cause injury to either that guy or you and two, it just could cause injury to your quarterback because you guys miss an assignment. Yeah, no, I mean, it's super important to make sure like all of those things are figured out. Like it's no other position has the need for cohesiveness between all five guys doing the exact same job I mean, yeah. different assignments, but like the exact same scheme, the exact same like alignment, the whole thing that is, there's no other position in, in really, I don't think there's another position in sports, like the offensive line that no. requires that sort of communication. And if one guy does one thing wrong, sometimes somebody can compensate for that. But by yeah. and large, that's a, that can be a detriment. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think, right. Like I look at the Bengals uh, last season I mean, it took them to, and and I know because people are going to say it's OTAs. It's not that important right now. They had guys not show up to OTAs. They had guys who, I I think there were guys that, everybody was there for training camp, but nobody played in preseason. Mm -hmm. That offensive line wasn't good till like week four. Yeah. I mean, that was. (laughs) Like like Joe Burrow was was running for his life. It's a big story. And sometimes those things get worked out when you have good players that typically do, but doesn't mean you're not going to be going through a rough stretch and you want to avoid that. Yeah. He got yeah. sacked a ton in the first like quarter of the season last year because of how poor the offensive line played in Cincinnati. No, yeah, a hundred percent. So they, they gotta listen, Nate. I, I don't know. Listen, and and I'm sure there'll be something that comes out where it's like he was with his family, or there's some and, story and that's why that'll we come have out. To kind of like pump. It's the just speculation. Like, yeah. yeah, you can't go. You can't go like this guy's gonna be a terrible player. I think Nate Davis is gonna be a really good player in this offensive zone blocking scheme. I think he's a really good signing. I just mm-hmm. want to see my signings here. Let's get into this fourth quarter. Finish this out because. There was some interesting comments yesterday from both Cody White here and Khalil Herbert uh, that I thought were were really, you know, telling about what this Bears team feels. It's a Cody White here talked about how the vibe is different around this team. We saw right like these guys are just really enjoying their time together. It seems like when they're playing on the field, it's not just guys going through the motion. You see the team coming together, the love that they seem to show for each other already. Mm -hmm. Does it feel like that when you're out there, when you're seeing these guys on the field? I think at any, any May, June that you're out covering a team, everybody feels like they have all of the resources, all of the pieces in place to, shock the world if you're a team that even last year like we knew remember going back to otas and watching justin fields like really struggling like early on with the timing and of course he's working on like the very fundamentals of the offense and his footwork and you know there was still hope like every hope springs eternal there's literally a phrase (laughs) about it and 
every team is going to feel like they can win a Super Bowl at this time of the year. Everybody's zero and zero, starting from the same spot. And I think a lot of times you hear like what, what Cody Whitehair said or what, um, you know, every Khalil Herbert quote, like when he was asked about like, is it a different vibe now? And he said, definitely. We've got a great group of guys, everybody coming out with the mindset of getting better every day and having fun. You can see it out there on the field. Like, the ultimate you're cliche. Go- you're going to have fun if you're in, not in pads and smacking each other in the head, yeah. which they don't typically do. Like, you know, you're not supposed, you cannot tackle to the ground. That's what they got in trouble for last year. Got <laughs> I was going to say, well, like, like last year, like, <laughs> we, we, but this is, this is light work for them. Yeah. Like, and that's fine because everybody feels like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. When it gets really hard, that's when the mindsets can change. And I think it's just, I, I don't know. I looked into it. Like I hear the comments and I, and you look into it and you say, okay, how much of this is just a byproduct of this time of the year versus, you know, I think that they've gotten the hard part, the hardest part out of the way. Year one of a rebuild sucks. Losing sucks. Like the whole yeah. thing is awful. Um, yeah. And it takes a mental fortitude that not many have to be able to get through that unscathed and you don't get through it fully unscathed. But I think because it's like, okay, at least we don't have to go through that again. That's why the mindset of, of a lot of guys is, okay, whew, the collective breath, breath. We got through the hardest part of this rebuild. Now we feel like we can actually go out and do something, that we're not just going to be like struggling to, to feel the team in games, but that they can actually you know, prove to people, hey, we, we are a good football team. Like It's going to yeah. probably look like a mess at times still because there are missing pieces and they are still learning. Um, you know, they're a young team, but I, I don't know if I put so much stock into it and be like, Oh my gosh, like Super Bowl for this team. They're going to, or they're going to shatter <laughs> expectations and they will be a 10 win team and win, yeah. you know, go to the playoffs. I, I just think everybody at this time of year is optimistic because you haven't been hit with adversity and hardship just yet. I th- Here's where I look at it. And I say that this is different. I've watched bad OTAs. I've seen OTAs where you go in and you're like, hey, he should be able to make that throw or he should be able to catch that football. Heck, last season, right, we talked about how many times did Justin make a pass in OTAs and one of the wide receivers from last year dropped it. It was like it was a really nice thrown ball, but he dropped it. That was very indicative of what we saw throughout the entire season. I'm taking in all of the Kool-Aid that I can right now because – OTAs is finally good, and that's the time when we can be like, it doesn't matter that they're doing that. It mattered when Mitch was overthrowing guys. It mattered when Justin was hitting guys in the hands and they were dropping it. I'm going to say it matters a little bit that the vibe is different around the team. The vibe of actually being able to get in the end zone. You saw that pass from yesterday. The Bears tweeted out where Justin's able to thread it through two DBs and get DJ Moore in the hands. And my God, DJ Moore caught the football. (laughs) It's the simple things, but I do think that it matters, at least if in the sense of building the camaraderie and building the trust Mm -hmm. in the players that you have on the field. And showing, hey, we can make these plays. They might be like what you might not have pressure in your face, but you can make these plays. Yeah. But they're just they're not at the ground level anymore. I think that that's just like the very basic nature of this thing. Like, wow, right. this is what happens with how good you feel when you have talented players around you that you're not just like, hey, man, it's going to be a tough year. Because if you know from the beginning it's going to be a tough year, that's that's you know, and you have months until the end yeah. of the season, that's a hard pill to swallow for a Wait, lot of Wait, is guys. this how the rest of teams felt? Is this normally how teams feel in OTA? And, and you got to <laughs> think about it too. Like, when was it, like, you know, for, for a team to have a winning season? You know, not, none of the guys here, really, by and large, most of the guys here have not been part of that. I mean, of course, the free yeah. agent signings, like, you know, that's different. But the homegrown guys. Tremaine's been a part of it, yeah. Yes, yeah. like the homegrown guys, like the Jalen Johnson comment I keep thinking about, like I've never been part of a winning season since I was drafted. Yeah. That's that's tough for a lot of guys, and they don't know how to get there yet. So, I mean, Tremaine Edmonds, I asked him about it last week with, you know, how different is it for this team versus, like, when you were with Buffalo, all those seasons after they finally got over the hump, they figured out the recipe to get to the playoffs and how he's like, everybody feels the same way though, at this time of year. Like, it's not like, Oh, well the bears like have never won. So they don't know how to do OTAs. They don't know how yeah. to like approach the off season. Everybody feels optimistic, whether you're a team that had three wins last year, whether you're a team like Buffalo that went to the second round of the playoffs. So I, 
I think there you can definitely put stock into it, and it is good to be able to see. Okay, these are like this is a skeleton look of what this play could look like yeah. in the regular season. Guys are moving it, you know, three quarter speed, but showing you can still execute the very simple fundamental things within the offense and defense. Of course, you're going to feel good about that, and you know these are shorter work days. They get to go home on the weekends. Like it's. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, certainly work, but it's not like the pressure of like the week in and week out grind that really wears on people. Yeah, it, it was, it was, uh, it, it's good to hear these guys, I guess, enjoying themselves, having a good time where I've, like you said last year, it was the building blocks. And so they literally were just like, man, we're just trying to get figured out yeah. and get better. Like, I, I think the, the part that's the most telling and that probably, I guess, gives me a real level of excitement as well is remember last year in OTAs when everybody was just like, we're running a lot. Yeah. Like we're, I'm tired. Like we're running the conditioning a lot. element. I don't, you, we, you know, we haven't seen all that much of it yet. Yeah. But it's, I definitely think that there was a message put out last year of like what type of team they're going to build and culturally how they're going to get there by the physical nature of like the conditioning element that, yeah. you know, you just don't see. Like usually, some coaches are like willing to be a little bit more hands off and, you know, treat OTAs kind of like club med. I know that, you know, they're, you know, in Minnesota, they were doing that when Kevin O'Connell got there, which was a stark contrast from what it was like under Mike Zimmer by and large. But I think that Matt Eberflus was really trying to send a message to guys about what he was going to expect. And sometimes that comes down to the very fundamental things of we're going to run your ass, like to, to see if you can like handle <laughs> yeah. being here and, and see if you can handle like the demands that we're going to, of you yeah and it just feels like this year right they came in with the expectation and they came in ready yeah like that that's the biggest thing like you haven't heard anybody talk about i'm tired yeah i'm sure that i'm sure there's a level of i hope you're not tired at like this at this point of OTAs <laughs> though because that's like that I, i'm not saying that would be like you know a red flag but that yeah. would be kind of concerning where it's like yeah. man what are they doing like and What's your you know, off or like? You know, or was there something with the player that's like, man, is there, did he, did he you know, lose a step of athleticism? Is he yeah. hurt? All those things. So it's good that you're not hearing that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast, Courtney. We put on sure another is. great episode as always. You gave me a little advice on, uh, you know, what I should do with my guys in Vegas. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited sorry. for you to report back next week about how that went. <laughs> We are poor. That's, <laughs> that's how it's going to go. Either way. We are poor. Like, it's Vegas at the end of the day. But I uh, appreciate you guys for tuning in and rocking with us. Still got another episode tomorrow that we will be getting in. I will be in Vegas recording that. So if I have sunglasses on, mind your business. Uh, follow us on everything at the Chicago Bears Podcast. You can also follow us on everything at ESPN Chicago. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the page. And let us know how you guys are feeling in the comments below. And drop a bird down if you made it to the end of the pod. As always, for Courtney Cronin, it's your boy, Pat the Designer. Back at it again. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. Peace.